so much has been said about Jesus. Countless books have been written, sermons preached, stories told, all to help us comprehend the most profound person who ever lived. But to know the real Jesus, to uncover who he is and who he is to us, there are no better words than the ones he used to describe himself. Well, hello, friends. If I haven't met you before, my name is Brian. I'm one of the pastors here at Christ the King Church. And before we get too far into things, I want to make sure that you're engaged. I want you to look at your neighbor and tell them on a scale of 1 to 10 how good you are at keeping plants alive. <laughs> 1 to 10. You guys must be talking about something else because that shouldn't take this long. <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you right on the front end that my dad grew up on a fourth generation farm in Albert Lee, Minnesota. And friends, when I tell you that you've never seen a farm quite like the Barron's farm, I am not exaggerating. It is stunning. All of you OCD people would love it there. The grass has never been greener and it's always freshly cut. There's never a dandelion in sight and the flower beds look immaculate. I don't know how they do it, but it always looks like a commercial from Miracle Girl. <laughs> it's just a little bit more colorful and a little bit bigger than everybody else's farm. It's beautiful. So that's my dad. Then there's my mom who went to school for forestry and she's this amazing gardener. She has this garden up in the interior of Alaska that she grows cabbage the size of your head. And to say that this garden is pristine is an understatement. Everything is labeled and mapped in a way that allows it all to work together in perfect harmony. I'm telling you, this garden could literally be on the cover of a magazine. It is that beautiful. So that's my mom. She loves plants and plants love her and then then there's me <laughs> and let's just say that I'm on the opposite end of the spectrum the green thumb must have skipped a generation my mom once gave me a plant that was supposed to be the cockroach of house plants it was supposed to survive the apocalypse but it couldn't survive three months under my care <laughs> so, so that's what I'm dealing with I've never met a house plant I couldn't kill and ironically the only plant that I haven't seemed to kill is the one that I've spent the last seven years of my life dedicated to trying to kill, which is the bamboo hellscape in my backyard. And that's another story <laughs> for another day. But long story short, if Facebook were to describe my relationship with Flora, it would be this. It's complicated. <laughs> On a zero to 10 scale, I put myself right around negative three. That's, that's kind of how I see myself. And yet today and this week, Jesus wants us to grow our understanding of who he is by using a simple word picture about a plant he says i am the true vine he says i am the true vine so like, we're going to read this together this is john chapter 15 verses 1 through 11 he says i am the true vine and my father is the gardener he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit and with every branch that does bear fruit he prunes it so that it can be even more fruitful he says, you're already clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. So remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. He says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. So if you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you will bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. So as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. So now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. And here's the last verse that I'll read for you. It says, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. So let me pray for you, Holy Spirit. We just acknowledge your presence here. God, we thank you, God, for your pursuit of us. We thank you for your invitation to not just be a distant God, but God, that you call us close. 
that you say we want to be connected to you, God, that you are the true vine. God, help us to not just know that in our brains, but God, to actually enact that in our lives because we don't want to just be a bunch of people with information. We want to be a bunch of people who are empowered by your spirit to go out and do the good works that you've created us to do. God, make us the light of the world that we were created to be. God, help us to be the people who abide, who remain in you. And God, today, I just pray that you would help us to see the good news that this really is. God, would it capture our hearts? God, would it move us to action? We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen and amen. So Jesus says, I am the true vine. And I might not be great with plants, but I love a good plant metaphor. But with this particular metaphor, I think it's so important to understand it in its context. Because this is one of those verses, friends, that we see a lot in Hobby Lobby art. Like This is one of those verses that we see above a lot of mid-century modern couches and very nicely curated living rooms with beautiful worship music kind of whispering politely in the background. It's such a beautiful verse. We read it and we say, that is so beautiful. But what we tend to miss when we see it through these lenses is the actual urgency in which Jesus spoke these words. Because as it turns out, these words were spoken mere hours before Jesus was arrested, detained, and killed. So this isn't an existential conversation about botany around the bonfire with the boys that Jesus was having. This was an important and urgent moment where Jesus, just before his death, is laying out for you and for me what's truly important in this life. And he says, I am the true vine. So there's an urgency that we often overlook. And today I want to speak to you about this urgency and actually uh, give a few thoughts about this statement, I am the true vine. But first things first, let's start with the question, what's a vine? I I don't want to assume anything here. What is a vine? In John chapter 15, Jesus is using this metaphor of the vineyard. And in the vineyard, the vine is the part of the plant that connects to the ground. So it's the part that draws up the nutrients to give to all the branches. So the vine is the source that gives the plant its sustenance. So Jesus is saying, I am the vine, which is to say, I am the source to your life. He's saying, I am the way through which you can get the nourishment that you need to keep going. But notice what he doesn't stop and say. He doesn't just stop and say, I am the vine. He actually says, I am the true vine. So he says, I am the true vine. And that word true is so important because when Jesus tells us that there's a true vine and that he is that true vine, what he's actually telling us is that there's false vines. He's saying that there are other things in this life that you will attach yourself to as you look for meaning. For some of you, that might be relationships. For some of you, that might be friendships. For some of you, that might be success or influence or money. And while none of those things are bad in and of themselves, what Jesus is saying is that none of them will ever be able to actually satisfy the hunger of your soul. So although they might be good about your life, they're not actually going to be something that gives you and sustains your life. They'll always leave you wanting more. And I've shared this quote with you uh, a couple times, but it's one of my favorites. It's uh, Jim Carrey, and he says, I wish everyone could get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so that they could see that it's not the answer. So Jesus is saying, be careful what you spend your time chasing. Because if success is the thing that you spend your life running after, you are going to live a life where you are out of breath because the finish line will always continue to get further and further away. Jesus says there's all sorts of vines in this world that you can attach yourself to, but there is one true vine and I am him. There is one source that can actually give you the nourishment to not just live, but live a life to the full. Jesus says, I am the true vine. Then he goes on and gives us a promise. And just by a show of hand, does anyone in here just love the promises of God? Is anyone thankful for the promises of God that there's not a promise that he gives that he won't fulfill? And with that on the tip of our tongues and at the forefront of our hearts, let me read this promise. He says, I'm the true vine and my father is the gardener. Here's the promise. He says, he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes 
so that it will be even more fruitful. I call this the promise of pruning. So here's the promise. Jesus says, in this life, you will be pruned. It was a setup when I had you put your hands in the air. We don't get excited about this one. This isn't many people's life verse. Like, this isn't hanging up on many walls, but this is the truth. He says, you will be truned in this life. And when I read this verse, and when I was reading this scripture, I was thinking to myself, man, Jesus really needs a lesson in marketing, because usually this type of content is the thing that you bury in the fine print. Usually this is like a part of the user agreement that they tell you to read, but you don't really read, and you just kind of scroll to the bottom and hope for the best and say, I agree. But not Jesus. Jesus isn't going to sugarcoat it. He actually leads with this statement. He says, if you hang with me, you will get pruned. And he doesn't just say that the bad branches get cut off. He says that the good branches get pruned. They get cut back. So if you're keeping score, every branch in this metaphor gets cut. And I'll be honest, I don't really like that about this verse because it's not what I expect it to say and it's not what I want it to say. What I want Jesus to say here is that the bad branches get cut out and the good branches get recognized for their good work and rewarded with chipotle burritos and blizzards and all God's people said (laughs) amen and amen. That's what I want it to say but that's not what it says. It says the bad branches get cut off and the the branches that bear fruit get cut back. And then you have to ask why, and Jesus actually speaks to the why. It turns out that it's so that they can produce more fruit. turns out that this is what Jesus is interested in in your life. He wants you to be fruitful. And this is where we start to see God's heart. He says, pruning's not punishment. It's actually about preparing space for what I want to grow in you. Because I want your life to be fruitful. And while that sounds great on paper, this is where things start to get confusing because oftentimes our definition of fruit looks a lot different than God's. Oftentimes the kind of fruit that you and I want to experience in our life looks like comfort, but the fruit that God wants to grow actually looks like Galatians 5 when it says this, the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So so if you're looking for blessing in the traditional sense, you might be let down because the fruit that God wants to grow doesn't look like luxury. It actually looks like love. It actually looks like joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. And I was thinking about this when it comes to this kind of fruit, it actually grows better in the valley than it does on the mountaintops. He says you're going to be pruned because when you're pruned, it actually creates space and it creates the environment for this type of fruit to grow in your life. Jesus says, this is what I want to flow out of your life. This is what I want your life to be marked by, not by luxury, but by love. So how do we do that? What do we actually do to create this environment? Jesus says in John 15, verse 4, remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And we've, we, we've looked at this scripture together before, and I've used this illustration, but I think it's worth repeating. And uh, before we get too, too far into it, though, I do want you to know that I know that you know that I know that this is not a vine branch. This is actually an apple branch. Maybe you're wondering why an apple branch, Brian. It's because I sent my kids out and I said, go get a branch. And this is the branch that they, they, they brought me. It's from an apple tree over in, in my parents' uh, orchard. And so, uh, so we're working with that apple tree. So, so go with me, if you will. And in this illustration, here's what I want you to see. I want you to look right here at this apple branch. And I want to ask you a simple question. How many of you believe that this apple branch right here will produce fruit this year? Can I get anybody in the back, in the back, in the back? Can I get anybody? Hands up. No. Okay, so we're at zero right now. Let me sweeten the deal for you. Uh, 
would it change your mind if I told you that this branch right here was committed to trying really hard? It was going to like, uh, like it was going to give everything that it had. Any, any hands? Can I get any hands in the back? No, 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 no. Okay, hey, we got one down here. Perfect. We're up to one. Okay, we got two hands. Three. Three in the back. Okay, last one. I'm going to sweeten the deal one more time. What if I told you this branch had every intention of producing fruit this year? Does that change your mind? Okay, we got a couple, but that's actually not what I'm going for. What I would love is for your hands to be firmly at your sides as you just realize that that is absolutely ridiculous to think that this branch could bear fruit because it's not actually connected to the source that allows it to grow. This branch is dead. It just doesn't know it yet. And it doesn't matter how hard it tries. It doesn't matter how great its intentions are. There is no way that this branch can actually produce the thing that it was created to produce because it has been disenfranchised from the thing that allows it to grow. And friends, here's the thing. This is the picture that Jesus says, this is what you look like when you try so hard to be good and you try so hard to be holy and you try so hard to produce fruit in your life apart from him. He says, it's not even cute, it's just sad. Because you're disconnected from me. And God actually wants your life to produce fruit, so this is what he says. He says, abide in me. Remain in me. Connect to me. Why? Because I want your life to produce fruit. Here's the thing that's just been blowing my mind. God doesn't want to be connected to you so that he can get something it's actually so that he can get something to you and this has been one of the most profound realizations in my faith journey is this idea that's so simple but that God doesn't need anything from me it's this idea that God doesn't need my money he's not poor God doesn't need my prayers he's not lonely God doesn't even need my worship. He's not a narcissist. As it turns out, everything that God invites us to do isn't for him, it's for us. And it's not that God needs my money, it's that I need a reminder that money's not God. And it's not that God needs my prayers, it's that I need to be constantly connected to him to remember that even when life looks bad, there's a God, there's a creator who is good, who listens to my every word. And he doesn't need my worship, but I need to worship God because I need to actually position myself where I remember who is in control. It's not me, it's about you, Lord. So every single step of the way, it's not that God needs something from me, it's that I need something from God. And God in his goodness and out of his abundant love for me says, will you connect with me? Will you remain in me? Not because I want something from you, but because I want something for you. He says, abide in me. And by the way, abide isn't an invitation to a life of busyness, it's an invitation to a life of blessing. In Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30, in the message, it says it like this. I don't know if this connects with you, but it says, are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? It says, come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Friends, this is the heart of God. You don't have to strive. You don't have to try harder. You don't have to fill your life with Christian activity. You don't have to do spiritual wind sprints in an attempt to get into better spiritual shape. Jesus says this is the invitation for you. Will you go on a walk with me and recover your life? Will you get away with me and learn the unforced rhythms of grace and see once and for all that I'm not playing the same game that the world is playing? John Piper says it like this. He says, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. So if you want to know how to position yourself to give God glory, we just have to position ourselves in such a way that we can see God's goodness and be satisfied in all that he's given us. Jesus says, abide in me. 
And I know some of you right now are thinking, I hear that, I like that, I want that, but if I'm really, really honest, I have no idea what that actually means. Like, how do you remain in God? How do you abide? What does that even mean? Well, verse 10, fortunately, actually tells us what it means. It says, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. So simply put, friends, when you remain in Jesus' love, or to remain in his love is to keep his commands. To abide in Christ is to obey the words of Christ. It's like Matthew 7 where it says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against it, yet it did not fall because it was on the foundation on the rock. But then he says, But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who builds his house on the sand. And the rain came down, and the streams rose, and the wind blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. And this has forever been one of my favorite parables because it's just these two stories that are completely parallel, and there's one thing that's different. And what I love about this story is it shows that the only difference between the wise and the foolish builder isn't what they know. It's actually what they do with what they know. So what that means is that wisdom, according to Jesus, isn't about what we learn. It's actually about what we live So the invitation to remain in Christ is the invitation to live like Christ, to actually do the things that Jesus did, to put into practice the rhythms of Jesus into our life. So what does that mean? That means we actually practice listening to God, and we practice prayer, and we practice generosity, and we practice love, and we practice sacrifice in such a way that it begins to change us from the inside out. Not because we have to, but because we get to. Not because we're checking off a spiritual box, but because we have a genuine hunger in our hearts to be changed by the creator of the universe. Jesus says, remain in me. Which isn't an invitation to learn more about him, it's an invitation to live more like him. Because friends, here's what I'm convinced of. What this world doesn't need is a bunch of Christians who are just debating theology on social media and looking for the newest ideas. But what the world desperately needs is more Christians who are committed to meet real needs in their communities and love real people in their neighborhoods and live lives that reflect the love of Christ to their families. Friends, that is what we need. Not better ideas, but better implementation of our ideas. And Jesus says, wisdom is not just learning, it's actually living what you learn. Orienting our lives in a way that's actually congruent with Jesus. That's what it means to be connected to the vine. Let's finish with verse 11. It says, I told you this so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. And I'll be honest, this has been the verse that really has, has come alive for me this week. Because after Jesus talks about all these vines and all these branches and all these gardeners and the pruning and the abiding, he actually goes on record and tells us what this whole metaphor is really about. And maybe you saw this coming like a a mile away, but I certainly didn't. As it turns out, this poem, this metaphor is about one thing and one thing alone, and that thing is joy. It's about joy. Jesus said, I told you all of this so that you could have joy. Joy. So if you want God's agenda with all of this, here it is. He wants to be connected to you. Why? So that he can give you joy. He says, will you go for a walk with me? Why? So that I can give you joy. He says, will you orient your life in such a way that it's marked by love? Why? So that I can give you joy. He says, connect to me. Remain in my love so that I can give you joy. Joy. This is what Jesus is interested in. And for the record, he's not talking about the superficial kind of joy. He's not talking about the I'm happy right now because I got the job and I got the blessing and I got the thing that I wanted. That's not what Jesus is talking about here. No, he's talking not about happy. Because friends, happy is fragile. Happy comes and goes like the tide. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about a joy that's accessible in every season, no matter how things might look. He's talking about a joy that comes from knowing that even when things are out of your control, they're still in his control. 
He's talking about a joy that says, I know I might not like what I see right now, but I'm still confident of this, that he who began a good work in me will be faithful to complete it on the day of Jesus Christ. He says, this is the kind of joy that I'm interested in giving you, not because life is easy, but it, because it's actually hard. And the question in my heart is not what Jesus is saying, it's what you're hearing. Because this is such good news, and really it comes down to, are we able to receive this news? Let me close with this story. When Kristen and I were just getting to know each other, one of the things that we had to navigate was the process of learning how to interpret one another's text messages. And I'll be honest, my text game has never been my greatest asset. I like to think I'm better in person, but that's up for debate as well. But back in college, one of the things that I just thought was so hilarious that I just loved to do with texting is I would just love to text people the letter K with a period behind it, like just, just K, no other context, just K. And so for example, she would say something along the lines of, great, I'll see you at six, and I would respond with the letter K, nothing more, nothing less, simple. And this went on for some time. She would text me like the kind person that she is, and I would continue to respond with the letter K like I'm a kindergartner. Then here's how dumb I am, church. This whole time, I thought I was killing it. Like, I thought this must really be resonating with her spirit. This whole time, I was convinced that she was picking up what I was throwing down. I assumed that she's probably thinking, man, this is classic. This Brian has a great sense of humor. I should probably date him. That's what I thought that she was picking up. But here's the problem, much to my chagrin, what I later came to understand is that what I meant to be flirty and endearing wasn't actually coming across as flirty and endearing. In fact, it was coming across as, as disinterested and cold. And here's how I found out, I'm very perceptive. I found out because she confronted me and she sent a text that said, hey, just so you know, when you respond with the letter K, it's not cute, it actually comes across as very disinterested and cold. <laughs> and I said, really? She said, yeah, really? And I thought about it for a second, then I responded the only way I knew how in that moment, which is with a single letter. <laughs> said K. And for the record, I immediately apologize and haven't done it since. But my point is this, often, often there's a gap between what's intended and what's understood. Often there's a gap between what someone says and what the other person hears. I share this with you because I think that this happens so oftentimes when we read the scriptures. We misinterpret the text because we misunderstand the heart of God. We, we, we miss the message because we misunderstand the dynamic between us and the one who created us. There's this guy, David Benner, who's this sociologist, and he did an experiment where he met with a bunch of people and he asked them the simple question. He asked, what do you think the first thing that comes into God's mind is when he thinks about you? And after conducting all of these interviews and talking to all these people, he came up with one word that got mentioned more than any other word. And that word was disappointed. I think God must be disappointed in me because I'm, I'm not that good at following him. I'm not that good at being good. I've got real issues, so God must be disappointed when he looks at me. And I get that, really, I do. I've struggled with this, too. But here's the problem with that answer, friends. It's just not what the Bible teaches. Here's the one problem with this narrative. It's that it's not actually true because the Bible doesn't teach that God's disappointed in you. The Bible teaches that because of Jesus, God delights in you. And I would argue that the first thing that God actually thinks about when he thinks about you is this, it's joy. It's the heart of a father. It's love. And this week as I've been thinking about this God that not only has joy, but who is joy and who wants joy for you, as I've been thinking about this God that Dallas Willard describes as the most joyous being in the universe. I can't help but wonder if there might be a gap between what he's saying and what you're hearing. Because if you just think that he's looking at you and he's disappointed when he's really looking at you in delight, I wonder how much of his heart we're missing in between. I wonder how much of his message we're missing in the middle. If you take one thing away from this message, let it be this, God is not disappointed in you. 
I was thinking about it this way. God doesn't have an RDF. If you're wondering, what's an RDF? That's a resting, disappointed face. (laughs) When he looks at you, it's not with disappointment, it's with delight. I want you to know that God's not mad at you. He's actually madly in love with you. I just can't help but wonder how different your life and your relationship with Jesus might be if you could just see the way that his face lights up when he looks at you. And friends, it's with this lens, it's through that lens of thinking about a father who's just looking with joy at you that he says, remain in me because I am the true vine and because I want to give you joy. Church, I wonder, are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Because this is what Jesus says. He says, come away with me and you'll recover your life. He says, I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of my grace. So church, here's the application. Here's the invitation for you this week. Will you go for a walk with this Jesus? Will you create space and margin in your calendar for this Jesus? Not because you have to, but because you get to. Not because it's a checklist item, but because there's a genuine hunger in your spirit to be changed by this God that is marked by joy. Friends, will you go for a walk with Jesus and will you ask these two simple questions while you walk? What is the one thing and the one place that I've cut myself off from you? We're called to be connected. What's the one thing that I've connected myself to that is actually impeding my ability to connect with you, Lord? So what's one place that I've been cut off? And then here's the other question. What's one way that I can connect myself to you today? And that's really between you and the Lord. Maybe there's an area of your life that for a long time he's been saying, yes, that. Yes, give me more of you. Not because I want something from you, church, but because there's something new that I want to give you. Will you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for your kindness. We thank you, God, that your heart is for us, God, that you are not a taker, you are a giver. God, that your word says, God, that you gave. God, that that is your posture, that your posture towards us isn't disappointment, it's delight. God, would you help us to span that gap between what we think about ourselves and what we think about our relationship with you and what it truly is. God, you say that you take joy in us that you sing songs over us. God, help us to just take a step towards being closer to understanding that as a reality in our life. God, help us to abide. God, help us to see that the pruning was meant to produce space for more fruit. God, we don't want our lives to be marked by luxury. We want them to be marked by love. God, show us what that looks like today. And God, my prayer is that we would take seriously this invitation to today or sometime this week to just go simply be in your presence and to remember that the way that you look at us, the first thing that you see is joy, that you smile when you speak. God, would that change our hearts this week? God, would that change our community? Would that change our world? God, that is what this world needs, is Christians who are actually committed to walking the way that you walked and living the way that you lived. Show us what that looks like. Give us boldness. We ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, amen Amen and amen. So if you have any prayer requests, I want to invite you. There's going to be a team up front that would love to pray with you. And if you're online or if you are in a hurry, you can always go to prayer.ctk.church. And there's a group of people who would love to be praying over that this week. So have a blessed week. Remember that God, when he looks at you, looks at you with joy. Be blessed and we'll see you next week.